We're excited to welcome you to this session on such an important topic. You know, the patient is at the center of our work, and staffing is an essential dimension of the entire patient experience. So balancing nursing workloads is a key performance imperative for hospitals and healthcare systems. This is uh, Dr. Jack Needleman from the uh, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Go ahead and take it, Jack. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about how to create a model for uh, acuity-based uh, systems and talk a little bit at the very end about uh, the business case for these models. I want to begin with a very brief discussion, which John has set up very well, on why acuity-based staffing systems uh, are needed and why they're valuable. Uh, so next slide, please. Let's start there. Um, the first reason why these systems are increasingly important is because state legislation uh, is increasingly demanding them. Uh, you, you could argue that the Joint Commission already is demanding something like this, but uh, the enforcement, frankly, has been a little loose. Uh, but what we're seeing is state legislation and requirements that mandate uh, appropriate staffing and appropriate staffing systems. The one everybody knows about is California, which has mandated minimum nurse to patient ratios, but I would point out those are minimum in the California regulation, the California statute goes on to say if you need more than the minimum, you better have more than the minimum, and that requires having a system uh, for doing it. There are other uh, state legislation, uh, seven states are requiring hospitals to have staffing committees responsible for plans and staffing policy, and that means typically having a staffing model in place at the unit level that enables the uh, the hospitals to um, to assess whether or not there's what staffing they need. That is basically the model that ANA has been pushing in legislation. There are other modifications of that. Massachusetts has one required to ICU. Minnesota is requiring uh, the CNO or designated develops core staffing with input from others. And five states have some form of disclosure or public reporting of staffing. And increasingly, those are going to require both uh, what was your staffing and also what staffing was needed to allow the patients and their families to better assess things. And this continued pressure to expand this kind of legislation. So just the external demands on hospitals for decent measures of what staffing is needed and how you staff against those models is core. Uh, but And I think that's part of the recognition that nursing uh, needs to be viewed not as a cost center of hospitals, but as a core service with expectations that, can it, that it can be delivered reliably and in ways that keep patients safe. And that gets me to the second reason for these systems. Uh, next slide, please. Which is that um, uh, we have substantial and growing body of evidence that uh, efficient care and patient safety require adequate staffing based on patient need. Uh, the, as of 2007, which is where the data on this slide comes from, there were many studies which looked at patient outcomes and length of stay and finds a very clear association between uh, longer length of stay and more adverse outcomes in hospitals that were short st that had lower staffing levels. Uh, and this has been taken as an indication of the need for adequate staffing. Next slide, please. Problem with those studies is they're not causal, and we're not going to have a randomized control trial of staffing. I don't think any of your hospitals are prepared to uh, uh, put randomize the staffing on units. Uh, the closest we're going to come to uh, a randomized trial is, is this one that my colleagues and I did and published in the New England Journal in, in 2011 in which we had a single hospital with an acuity-based system that reported how many hours of nursing care were needed on each unit on each shift. And they also kept track of how many hours were actually there, actually provided. Um, and uh, the hospital also could track which patients were in which units on each, uh, on each shift. So we could track patients that, that encountered short staffing. Next slide, please. And when we uh, looked at patients, uh, we looked specifically at mortality. Uh, and what we found is that uh, there was an increased risk of death with greater exposure to uh, lower RN staffing, short staffing, 
units that had shifts that were substantially below what the target amount was. Um, and the numbers that you see here actually look very similar to the numbers that come from the cross-sectional high staff, low staff studies. So if somebody says, yeah, but are those studies causal, this is the one to throw on, on the desk of the, the skeptic. Uh, this study is being replicated in a number of places right now, and I think we'll have more examples of, of this within hospital variation and its impact on outcomes that people will be able to refer to in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So um, if the case is made that we need to get the staffing right to keep patients safe and deliver care reliably, what are the factors that go into assessing the right staffing? And uh, as John alluded to, a patient is not a patient is not a patient, and a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse, and frankly, the unit structure varies substantially and may influence staffing as well. So if you're looking at the factors that influence right staffing, whole series of patient characteristics, their, their, acu their nursing acuity, not their overall acuity, their nursing acuity, um, uh, their ability to carry out the activities of daily living, uh, their dementia state, uh, their psychosocial needs, their emotional needs, and frankly the needs of their families and others who are involved in their care as well. Nurses also make a difference. The education of the, the nurse, the experience of the nurse, can influence whether or not uh, a nurse is a good match for a, a patient and how many patients that nurse should be taking on on a given shift. And then a whole series of organizational and, and unit characteristics, including things like the physical layout of the unit, how far people have to go to get uh, supplies, for example, will influence how much staffing is needed on a, on a unit. So these are examples of the factors that have to be taken into account in an acuity system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that concept of what's going on with the patient is clearly the thing that tends to dominate the acuity uh, models that are out there. And uh, nursing acuity is, slightly, is clearly different from, from diagnosis, as Do John pointed out. And here are some of the examples of, of factors that influence the patient need for nursing care. How many medications they're having? how many procedures the nurses have to carry out on that unit for that patient. What kind of education requirements does the patient and their family have? And what kind of psychosocial support does the patient and their family need? And uh, one example of medications are the role of IV medications in particular because of the, the complexity in getting them ready and the complexity of, of actually administering the drug. So these are examples of the factors that can influence the right staffing and that need to that potentially go into having an acuity based system that will let us measure the acuity of patients across a unit and determine what kinds of staffing are needed on that unit for that shift. Next slide please. If you're trying to create such a system, then there are criteria for the system itself. And the first one I would argue is important is parsimony. Nurses have too much to do already, so systems which can minimize the demands on nurses to classify the patients or to assess the patients are clearly advantageous. So parsimony in a system is one of the key factors and is this a system that's going to be workable for us. Uh, there's also a need to, to base it in expert nurse judgment. Uh, nurses understand the care processes better than anybody else. Uh, they need to be systems have a true reflection of the nurse's work uh, and a variety of indicators that are appropriate to measure patient collect complexity and the appropriateness of need and the available other resources in the system. So these are some of the criteria for evaluating different systems. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at the range of systems that are out there, uh, there are commercial systems that you can uh, pick up and adopt, and we also see in the, in the field many locally developed systems. The advantages of the commercial systems uh, are they use an existing algorithm, uh, so you're, you're buying into an, ex you don't have to develop your own. They can be calibrated to the local nursing model, and modules can be implemented that allow for the tracking of actual versus target. That 2011 New England Journal article 
uh, was heavily dependent upon the fact that the, the academic medical center involved in that research had a commercial system in place. Uh, one of the cons of these systems is they tend to be very elaborate in the criteria, the factors that they want collected about each patient, although the vendors have been sensitive to that and they're increasingly trying to mitigate the data entry burden by linking to the electronic health records. Uh, the other thing I noted in, uh, in a number of these systems is they don't take turnover into account. And I assume staffing is based upon normal turnover, but every now and then you get a shift with very high discharges and admissions, and those imp impose additional burdens, and those also need to be taken into account in, in thinking about what the staffing on a unit needs to be for a given shift. The advantages of locally developed systems is that they can be adjusted for local patient variation on specific units or conditions that the nursing staff consider relevant. And they are typically built on a consensus model with uh, the nursing staff, the nursing leadership uh, coming together with an understanding of how do we think about what our staffing looks like. The cons here are possible data entry burdens because that they often have not been automated and no linkage to tracking data entry and storage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me show you two examples of local models that can be adopted. Uh, this is uh, an example of one that came from an article in 2007. You'll notice down the left side here that some of the factors they wanted to take into account, Com whether there are medications for the patient, the complication of procedures, patient education, psychosocial needs of the patient and their family, and whether there are complicated IVs and meds. And you can see that as uh, you can place the, the patient each of in each of these areas on a scale from one to four, and you add it up and you get some measure of the complexity of the, this patient, some measure of the complexity of all the patients on that shift as, as a whole, and that, that gets crosswalked against us. So how many hours of nursing care do we need on this shift? How many nurses do we need on this shift? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's another example of a locally developed system uh, ba uh, developed in a, a small hospital in, in Washington State where as part of a nurse-driven staffing demo. So this hospital started with a grid system for its staffing. So many uh, RNs per patient, so many PCAs per patient, uh, or so many patients per RN, so many PCAs per patient. And then the charge nurses were given the freedom to adjust the staffing based upon the local circumstances. And what you see at the bottom of this slide uh, is the range of things that the nurses decided were important in saying we, we need an additional RN or we need an additional PCA. And they include such various things as three or more patients in isolation or uh, three or more patients that are one-to-one -one feeders or two or more blood transfusions for the RNs with respect to the PCAs, patients in isolation, uh, patients that are observation, again, feeders showing up there. Uh, and this was this system has been implemented. It, it, there are frankly not very many variations from, from the grid where they've implemented it, but uh, it is the nurses on the unit owning the uh, nurse uh, the nurse staffing on that unit, which was a very important thing in this hospital. Next slide, please. Uh, so we see in in this range of of systems a variety of uh, ways of of accomplishing uh, estimating the acuity of patients shift by shift and adjusting the nursing nurse staffing accordingly. Question is uh, can uh, so the, I've been asked to comment on the business case, and the question is, so how much is appropriate staffing going to cost? How much more is it going to raise costs to hospitals, and is this affordable? Um, there are four published business case analyses uh, that I've identified in the literature in one form or another uh, that estimate the, the cost of, of raising nurse staffing to appropriate levels and offsetting those costs with a reduced length of stay and reduced adverse events. Uh, this comes from a study that Peter Bierhaus and I did in 2007, and you can see that bringing hospitals up to the top quartile in terms of staffing in our sample 
had a substantial impact on reducing length of days uh, and reducing adverse events and reducing deaths. Those deaths make it clear that the social case for raising nurse staffing to appropriate levels is clearly made. Uh, the, those systems pay for themselves taking to full, uh, full social cost. Next slide, please. What we, what we found and what others who have done the business case analysis have found is that they don't quite fully reimburse the hospital for the additional cost of nursing, but they come pretty close, a half a percent uh, additional cost of nursing on average across our whole sample. Uh, these look like relatively modest numbers. And if you go to the vendors for the commercial acuity systems, they will haul out their unpublished studies that show additional aspects of the business case uh, for these kinds of models. I would also note that all of the business cases to date do not fully take into account value-based um, uh, payment. They don't take into account the penalties that hospitals have for lower HCAP stores or for readmissions or for um, hospital-acquired infections. And as we get more and more variables affecting the payment, uh, the business case for bringing nursing up to the appropriate level, I think, is going to become stronger and stronger. Next slide, please. So uh, my closing thoughts on this, other analyses go talk to the acuity system vendors for additional analyses. The other thing is whether hospitals can retain savings depend on the payment models. And hospitals should want the most inclusive payment models they can get per admission rather than charges, uh, bundled payments and capitated payments rather than per simple per admission charges. So final closing thoughts. Nursing is a core service, of, service line of hospitals, not just a cost center, and should be assessed as a service line. Safe, reliable, effective nursing care depends on staffing at adequate levels. And we have systems, both commercial and locally developed, that can assure that more appropriate levels of staffing matched to patient acuity uh, are, can be put in place.